dude, Nathan Ashcraft. He takes, uh, he, he takes um, a class called Energy Ventures, which Georgina Campbell took, who is from Cardiff. And um, he loves, he, he really gets into it. But he's a PhD, and he, he, he wants to start a company. And so after, uh, he took the class before he finished his PhD. So he finishes the PhD over the, over the summer. He comes back um, in September, and then he, um, he's written a business plan, and he said, I come in, he goes, Bill, will you help me raise money and for, for my new company? It's called Dipole, and it's a membrane technology from the material science group at MIT. Don't worry about, you know, too much about the technology. This, this is, and, and I say, all right, what, you know, what, you want me to help you raise money? And he gives me something like this. He says, yeah, here's, my, here's the business plan based on kind of the format that you had for the class, and um, uh, can you help me raise money? I say, well, Tell me about it more before I have to read through the whole thing. I knew you'd say that. Let me give you my elevator pitch. Here's the elevator pitch in one slide. Dipole is a membrane science that my PhD thesis over here. And basically, it is, uh, it is a breakthrough um, technology that allows you to get 53% more power output than other membranes before it. So this means that fuel cells will now be so something. And everybody wants power. The market is infinite here. It's the whole world. And by the way, it also decreases methanol. Methanol being very bad for the environment, this will decrease methanol output by two orders of magnitude. Very compelling value proposition. And not only is this a technology in the lab, we have figured out how to make it into a product. So I have a value proposition. I have a product now. And by the way, that product is protected through the intellectual property. Um, so you're, do you like this? You're, you're, you're the professor. Do you like this? Yeah. Excellent. So what do, what do we do? What do, you tell, what do you tell Nathan? Go find a customer. Everybody. Do, do, you, do you use power? That's a big market. You're not thinking big enough. <laughs> what do you do? Are you a professor? Are you an entrepreneur? A academic, yes. Yes. Yeah. Anybody else? Team, yeah. Questions about team, questions about market. Competitors, competitive advantage, yeah. Think about the competitors. Costs, how much does it cost? Okay. So let me tell you what I told them. I, you know, we, we, we do the exercise. We're gonna, I want to save from other exercise. This one's quite simple. What I told him was, uh, Nathan, you need to talk to a friend of mine's uh, kid named Alex. And he said, what does Alex do? I said, he's in the lemon business. He goes, no, Bill. God. This is not synthetic biology. This is membrane science. You know, you're really, you got it wrong. I said, no, I'm not talking about synthetic biology. I'm talking about what Alex does is he squeezes lemons, he puts water in that lemon juice, and he puts sugar in it, and he does this amazing thing. He then takes that le lemonade, and he, he gives it to these people, and then there's this amazing thing that they give him money. It goes like this, you know. He gets money for it. And he was looking at me like you're looking at me right now. Like, are you insulting me? And I said, Nathan, the first lecture of every class that I teach says there is one single and necessary and con sufficient condition for a business. And if you have this condition, you have a business. And if you don't have this condition, you do not have a business. And what is that condition, sir? You need a paying customer. If you do not have a paying customer, you do not have a business. There is no business here, and you do not have an analysis of the business. What you have here is a science fair project presentation. Everybody got that? And, and that's not what we do. We, we're not the Martin Trust Center for MIT science fair projects. We're for entrepreneurship, and the central theme for entrepreneurship is you must get paying customers. At the center of everything you do, if it, there's not a, a paying customer, and we're going to break that down a little bit later, to, 
you don't have a business. So don't make business more complicated than it needs to be. You got to get paying customers and you don't have an analysis here of your customers. You were right, but you ruined the drama, so I had to cut you off there, sir. <laughs> but, but that's correct. You have to always understand at the end of the day, the single necessary and sufficient condition for a business is a paying customer. And if you lose that focus because you're thinking about all these other things, you've lost what at, should be at the middle of yours. Yes, all these other things that we talked about, competition, costs, intellectual property, all that supports it, but at the central part of it, you need to have customers. Everybody got that, all right? Next one, all right? Um, so uh, this is, this is uh, let me just consolidate the story. I have a student who is an engineer, and uh, or dean, uh, he goes to a Rensselaer Polytech in upstate New York, and he, um, he, does, he, he does really well um, there as an engineer, and he goes um, and works at General Motors after he graduates. And he then um, uh, realizes that he likes cars, but he wants to get on the business side. He doesn't just want to grind the stuff out, some of the interesting stuff. So after like six, seven years at, at GM, he then leaves to go to a company called Anderson Consulting, which is now called Accenture. I don't know if you have that over here. And uh, it's kind of, and he thinks he's going to get from the technology side to, more to the business side. Well, he does a little bit, but he's a good engineer, so they keep, keep him in that. And so finally, he ends up going after four years there, he ends up going back to MIT for an MBA. Um, you have MBAs over here? Yes, management by arrogance. And... Uh, <laughs> And so he gets, uh, he, he takes entrepreneurship classes, he does really, really well, and he decides he really wants to jump completely away from this so he doesn't just get pegged as an engineer the rest of his life, even though he enjoys it, and he becomes a product manager for a high-tech company out in Silicon Valley, think Google. And he, make, he, he figures out how do you do this stuff to figure out who customers are and, and build that. And, he does really, really well, makes a lot of money in, in Silicon Valley, um, getting people to click on ads. And so he decides, well, you know, um, this has been great. I made a lot of money. Uh, you know, I'm getting older. I want to go back to, you know, he's getting to be his mid-40s. He wants to go back to where the weather is better. He wants to move back to Boston, um, where he doesn't have to deal with sun and things like that anymore. And... Um, and so he, he, go, he, he, he takes it, leaves his job, goes back and says, what business can I create where I can run it? Because I want to I have the clean slate and do it myself. So he looks around, looks at a lot of different things. He decides, damn, I always loved cars. Why don't I tie in the cars with my business stuff? And he decides that there is no good Lamborghini dealership. Do you have Lamborghinis over here? Not many. And there are not many in Boston, all right? There are not many in Boston. And, and, and at the time, Lamborghini is not owned by a uh, Volkswagen group. It is, and, and then Lamborghini uh, looks like this. It costs four, $400,000. Do you have these types of Lamborghinis over here? Yeah. So he loves this, and he wants to do that by, a, he wants to set up a Lamborghini, and he, and he it does the analysis, and there's nobody else who has a, a really good Lamborghini dealership. And he wants to bring kind of this experience, not just the car, but the whole experience to the United States. Like Starbucks brought, you know, Italian coffee. He wants to kind of be the Italian super high-end luxury car experience. So, and, and, and he has this plan so that northern New England, um, yeah, that's, we're going to just work with me here, all right? <laughs> so you got Maine, New Hampshire. Um, Vermont, and uh, then you've got Massachusetts, and you've got part of Connecticut here, the non-New York part. And he does his analysis and finds out there's about 2,500 people who are good candidates for him to buy a Lamborghini in, in the northern New England area. And, uh, and he sees his growth plan is to, is to sell to this people the whole experience. So not just the car, but 
coming to it, getting it serviced uh, over and over again, buying more. And then, but the real opportunity is probably down here in, in Connecticut and New York, where you're going to get 10,000 plus of them, he's estimating. Because uh, this is big money down here. And then, it, and then you could go down to Mid-Atlantic, to D.C. and Philly and uh, Baltimore. And this, but this is probably like similar to Massachusetts, uh, I'm sorry, northern New England. It's more than 2,500. Two but you can see an interesting thing. And, and if you know the Jamil Group, so I don't know if you know the Jamil Group, but they've kind of done this model in the Middle East with Toyota. And you, you can, it can be very profitable. So he analyzes it, says, I'm going to start up here. This is my beachhead market. He looks around and says, Boston, because when he lays out where the people are, his potential prospects, Boston's best thing. He goes and he builds this, he gets a spot in Boston and Back Bay, for if you, those of you who know Boston. This is a good place where you would do it. He gets on, 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 uh, on Commonwealth Avenue and he builds this beautiful space to bring people in. And it has these things called nano walls, top to bottom glass, like you'd see in a, in a modern cafe that you can see through, but when it's nice, you open it up. And then inside, he's got a Lamborghini. You know, here, it's quite, you know, as you see up there, draw attention. He's got pictures of beautiful people frolicking with other beautiful people in Monaco. Um, very beautiful people, uh, like Leonard DiCaprio and George Clooney before he got married. And, <laughs> and, uh, and he's got that. And then he has um, two technicians in here who are really, really good. They can fix anything. So if you bring your car in, you can have an Android 3 phone, and they can still fix that. They can fix anything you want in the car. They're fantastic engineers. And then to kind of cap it off, he makes some other investments in here. But to have this total experience when you walk in there, he goes out and he goes and he personally brings back not a great coffee machine, but an epic espresso machine that costs $75,000 from Italy. So when you come to this place, you don't forget the whole experience. When you walk in there, it's like, whoa, there's a Lamborghini. This is, like, this is what I want to be. And there's the coffee. And then you have that. Everybody got it? Cost, cost them, by the way, over $2, two million dollars to set this up. So he invests. And he has a grand, you know, he's done his work. He has his launch party. Um, and he launches. And, and he has like week one, um, he has like 100 people come to the launch, 100 plus people, and it's a grand event. And, that, and that's on Saturday. And then on Sunday, he's going to be open seven days a week, not, and, but not that one. Um, they were recovering, and Thursday, Friday. And so he kind of does that, and then he gets down to business. But nobody shows up at the shop. Zero people the first week. Oh, no problem. This, the, the word's getting out. The word's getting out. But nobody shows up the second week. Well, not a problem. Let's take out an ad. Let's, let's get the word out. You know, let's kind of do some things. And, uh, but again, third week, nobody shows up, even though he takes out an ad in the Boston Globe. So he says, think about it. Maybe we should take out an ad in the New York Times and the Wall Street Journal as well. So he, 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 he does this. But nothing seems to work here. And he, this goes on for six weeks. All right? And getting a little tense now after six weeks, <laughs> just to be clear. These guys in the back have been drinking a lot of the espresso because they got nothing else to do. <laughs> They've seen all the YouTube videos about fixing things back there. And every night now, they're starting to clean out their browser history, if you know what I mean. And so, so, but then what happens on the seventh week on Monday morning at 11.30 a.m. is up drives a two-and-a-half-year-old Volvo. Now, this is, this is seven years ago before Volkswagen bought Lamborghini and Volkswagen was bought by the Chinese, okay? It was still the kind of old-school Volvo that we remember. And 
and up drives a two and a half year old Volvo and out jumps Laura. Laura went to school with her dean, but she is seven years younger than him because while he had gotten all that experience before he went for an MBA, she went to an Ivy League school. She went to Princeton, came right out of Princeton, worked at Goldman Sachs for two years, and then went in and got her MBA. And then she popped out, and he'd kind of lost touch with her, but he know, he'd known she'd gone to McKinsey, this high-end, top consulting firm. And so and Laura jumps out and says, hey, Ardeen, it's great to see you. We haven't, I haven't, you know, I haven't seen you for 10 years since the reunion. And, um, he goes, yeah, it's great to see you. And he's like, what's going on? He goes, she said, I live by, by here and I drive by here all the time. He goes, how did you know I was here? She goes, oh, the class notes, I saw it. Now you have those great technicians in the back. And, and so I was really interested to see it. And so I thought today after I dropped my daughter off over here, um, I, she's at daycare. And he goes, oh, you have a daughter? He goes, oh, I have, I have two of them. One's, one's eight and goes to Windsor School and the one goes to daycare over here. And I drop her off two days a week. And... Uh, he goes, that's fantastic. Are you still working at McKinsey? He goes, no, I left McKinsey, you know, you know, about five years ago, but I'm really involved in my, my, my kids' schools now. And uh, so that's great. She goes, are you, are you enjoying it? life in general? She goes, oh, I love it. My husband teaches at BC Law School, and we go hiking up in the White Mountains in New Hampshire. Um, it's great. It is really great. We get to spend a lot of time with the kids. And... Um, he said, that's wonderful. She said, we should get together sometime. And uh, she, he says, sure, sure. I'm thinking, okay. <laughs> um, but he didn't, like Garris said, pull out his phone right away and book the meeting. She said, uh, I would, you know, but I also have a, a business proposition here that I would like to put on the table, Erdine. What I would like to do is I, I, what, I would like to offer you something that I think will help you and will help me. When I was growing up, I used to go with my father and we would get our car fixed. And the mechanic would explain what was going on and then when he fixed it, we knew what was going on and if something happened. And, and I always liked that. Now when I go to get my Volvo fixed, they always say, it's a computer. And they don't explain to me anything, like I'm stupid. And then it costs $1,500 and then something happens later and I bring it back and say, what's going wrong now? And they say, it's computer again. And then they have to do something. And that's not the case. I know that's not the case. But I don't know what to do, and I don't trust them. But I do trust you. And so what I want to suggest is you've got those great maintenance people in the back, don't you? I, that's what I read about. He goes, yeah, they can do anything. They, I'd like you to check out my Volvo and tell me if there's anything wrong. And I, it, if just for maintenance, I'll, I'll pay you. And if there's anything else you need to fix, just tell me what it is, and I'll pay you up to $1,500, no question asked. And I know you're thinking, well, I make as much money as if I worked on a Lamborghini. I went to, I went to, I have an MBA too. I am going to offer you margins that are the same or close to what you got. Let's call it 70, 80% gross margin. That means this is going to be profitable for you. So, um, so. Here's the question. Um, Erdine's thinking, wow, this, what an opportunity. What are you going to do? You're at your tables now. What are you going to do? Now, I want you to understand, your technicians can definitely fix anything related to this car. They can get the parts. There is nothing that will affect your Lamborghini dealership. There is nothing that will affect the warranty of this two-and-a-half-year-old Volvo. The question I have for you, you at your tables is, what are you going to do? Everybody got this? I'm Laura. I'm going to go get some espresso, and I will be back in four minutes, and I need an answer. And I want you to tell me, what are you going to do, and why are you, why are you doing it? What are the pros and cons? All right, let's, 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 make, this, let's make this simple here. Why would, you, why would you take it? We'll start with table three. Give me one reason. Cash. cash. Do we like cash? Yes. Yeah. Business depends on cash. Cash is oxygen. If you don't have oxygen, the body dies. The business dies. Okay. That's pretty low on Maslow's hierarchy. Necessary. Table two, what do you got? Yeah. We like, we listen to customers, right? Listen to customers. They, this customer is a paying customer. 
Do we like paying customers? Yeah. Table two? Do you want to add something? You're smiling in a very devilish way. What does that mean? Pivot. Yeah. Pivot. Let's get, let's let, let let's let's before we go to ugly babies, like everyone here, we're pivoting. You've heard that, right? We pivot. We're we're lean, lean, mean entrepreneurs. We pivot, right? That's a. Now let's go to ugly babies. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that's exactly where we're going to put the people rather than the customer. Okay. So all we had before was a concept. As they say, in concept, concept and reality are the same thing. In reality, concept and reality are usually totally different, right? Everybody got that? Get out of the, get out of the building and go talk to people. See the whites of their eyes. Okay? Table five. Why else? She's a friend, you know, she has expertise, you know, it's, it's traffic, you know, um, it's traffic, traffic, good? It's time as well. Yeah, traffic, she, so you're getting to, is this word of mouth? Visibility. Word of mouth, visibility. Uh, what, what was the other thing? Is that a reason to do it or not do it? <laughs> what? Yeah, you have the you have the the resources are there. You have a sunk cost. You had two people that are that are you got to pay them anyway. This could be a morale issue, right? Where they're saying, "What are we doing?" And you, all of a sudden, you got somebody there. Is is, is this an interest pivoting? Is this this could be a new market, a new business, right? Prep meets opportunity. Customer, yeah, we're customer driven. It's kind of like a, uh, we didn't put that down there, but morale, kind of like customer driven. We do what customers want, right? It's kind of a, a, a values thing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm going to just emphasize that. What else? Yeah. Trust network effects, word of mouth network effects, right? What, what about anybody else? The back, yes, LTV. What about potential upselling opportunities? Yeah. Well, you're shutting the. It sounds like you're shutting the door on them. It sounds a little like you know some biases here. <laughs> why can't Why can't Laura have excitement in her life? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Someone had their hand up back here. A loner. No, th this is the upselling opportunity, right? The, kind of related to that, upselling. She, she, she arrives home and her husband says, what do you have, Laura? You know, <laughs> Gee, I'd like to drive that around. And you're getting some free advertising with Laura's friends, co community. Yes. Yeah. New business. Okay. So we started off with some wackadoodles back there who said no. <laughs> so let's just let's do a quick vote. How many of you? Well, we didn't give a chance for the other people to to do it. But what was your what was yours reason? It's not our customer. Oh, here it comes. Get ready. The B word's coming. We would dilute our brand. Is that where, is that where you're going? I, I love that. I hear that from my MBAs all the way. It's a brand. What, what does that mean? Lifetime value of the customer. Wait, that's on this sheet. It's what your customer sees, so your reputation. Okay, how's that working? <laughs> <laughs> what, what we didn't 
Yeah, yeah, so by the way, I am, I, you know, I do teach MBAs. So, you know, that I teach engineers, I teach all, all the different types of people. But I'm always skeptical of like, con, con, you know, things that are too conceptual. <laughs> I want it to be real. I want it to be real. So when people say stuff, what do they mean by this? And I, and, and I want to see it translated into a concrete thing. Someone shows up and they, and they want to buy a Lamborghini. What do you do with the Volvo? It's kind of like when you're getting on the British Airways flight and someone's in economy and someone's in first class. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Seems to me like a solvable problem, all right? So your answer is let's get some spreadsheets out. <laughs> all right, let's, let's let, we, we, everyone's had their say. Let's vote now, okay? How many of you take the business? How many of you don't take the business? Oh, wow, we had some sleepers up here. <laughs> All right. So, so, but this, we just made this up. This would never happen in real life. Like, this is like total fantasy that you'd be selling product A and someone comes in and wants to buy product B. That would never happen in your business. <laughs> Everybody get it? That's sarcasm. Do you have that? <laughs> Uh, and this used to, ha so you all have, we have, has everyone here an entrepreneur? Has everyone been an entrepreneur? Yeah. So you all have had this problem. Yes? Yeah. And it could be as simple as, I don't want to buy your product, I want to hire you to do some services yes. for me. That's a, the most common one when you first get started. You're, you seem like a very smart, smart person. I would like to hire you. I don't want your product, but I will, I'd like to hire you at, you know, $100 an hour. So what do you do? And, and uh, this is the problem that I had in my businesses, and it always used to bug me. Because how do you think about this? You know, how do you decide? Do you take the business or not? You know? Um, and it, it gets at you. you. Do you know for sure you should take the business, or do you not know? Does anyone know for sure whether you take it? Someone said, well, it depends, you know. Uh, how do you think about this problem? Because for me, it was like, did the Celtics win last night, the, the Boston basketball team? Because if they did, I felt good, and then I would take the business. And if they didn't, you know, I heard a bad song on the way to work that day, I might not take the business. There was not a systematic way for me to think about this. And that always bothered me. So how should we think about this? Is there a systematic way to think about this? So we're going to come back to that. That is a long-term opportunity. But in business, there are short-term needs and long-term opportunities. So what I'm going to, I, I'm, let me just fast forward here. If we had, a, this would be a whole class at, at MIT. 